Brothers and sisters, the Lord be with you. And A reading from the Holy Gospel according to St. John. A man named John was sent from God. He came for testimony to testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. And this is the testimony of John. When the Jews from Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to him to ask him, Who are you? He admitted and did not deny it, but admitted, I am not the Christ. So they asked him, What are you then? Are you Elijah? And he said, I am not. Are you the prophet? He answered, No. So they said to him, Who are you? So we can give an answer to those who sent us. What do you have to say for yourself? He said, I am a voice of one crying out in the desert. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. Some Pharisees were also sent. They asked him, Why then do you baptize, if you are not the Christ, or Elijah, or the prophet? John answered them, I baptize with water, but there is one among you whom you do not recognize, the one who is coming after me, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to untie. This happened in Bethany across the Jordan, where John was baptizing. The Gospel of the Lord. St. Paul, in his letter to the Thessalonians today, gave us some good, concise advice for daily living. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. And in all circumstances, give thanks. Now, why is this such great advice? Because herein lies the secret to a happy life and an even happier eternal life. Rejoice always. Why should we rejoice always? Because Jesus Christ has given us a means to go to heaven when we die. And we didn't have that before. That alone should give us reason to rejoice always. And if it doesn't, I can't help you. If that is not sufficient reason to rejoice always, then all of this, the church, the sacrament, scripture, grace, is for naught. It's all pointless. Because if the promise of heaven ever after is not a sufficient reason to keep you content, keep you hopeful, keep you pushing forward for just one more day, then God is not your priority. Something else is. Whether it's esteem, pleasure, wealth, materialism, whatever if, the, whatever, if the promise of eternal life doesn't give you reason to rejoice, God is not your priority. And if God is not your priority, none of this works. Every December, I make it a point to watch three Christmas specials. Charlie Brown Christmas, How the Grinch Stole Christmas, and A Christmas Carol. And of the three, A Christmas Carol has always been my favorite. I've seen some good productions and some not-so-good productions. My favorite movie version by far is where George C. Scott plays the title role as Ebenezer Scrooge. I think that version sticks closest to Dickens' novel. What is Scrooge's problem? God is not his priority. Money is. And because God is not his priority, he can't see God in anyone around him. And even though he's rich, he's miserable. Ebenezer Scrooge is a case study in idolatry. Money is his idol. He feeds his idol. His idol brings him no joy, at least not lasting joy. He feeds his idol not because it brings him joy, but because he fears poverty. His idol demands more from him. He sacrifices for his idol. Bell, the love of his life, his friends, his former employer, even his own physical comfort, as testified by his nephew Fred. When his nephew Fred is talking about his uncle Ebenezer, he says he doesn't even use his money to keep himself comfortable. Yet the idol still brings Scrooge no joy. How many people go through life like this? God is not their priority. They're in bondage to an idol, money, flesh, power, alcohol, drugs, pornography, gambling. The idol makes them miserable, Yet they won't try to be free of it. They're afraid of living without it. Fear keeps many people in bondage to their sins. How many people uses their justification not to give to charity? I pay taxes to help the poor. 
which is the exact same justification that Ebenezer Scrooge uses. Are there no workhouses? Are there no orphanages? Are there no prisons? I'm taxed enough to support these institutions. The poor you speak of must go there. And after Ebenezer Scrooge has the encounters with the spirits, which changes his perspective and his priority, what is his first reaction when he wakes up on Christmas morning? He rejoices. And that rejoicing inspires him to be charitable to others. Charity is the physical manifestation of love. Now he can see God in his neighbor. That's why we need to rejoice always. Rejoicing always keeps our eyes fixed on God in heaven and enables us to see God in those around us on earth. Pray without ceasing. Why? Because if we don't, we'll forget why we need to rejoice always. Praying helps us to keep our priorities straight. Because let's face it, sometimes it's hard to rejoice when life is difficult. How can I rejoice when somebody I love very much has died? Because I can pray for that person's soul to help them get into heaven. So we can be reunited when I leave this life for the next. Look, Father, I can't be happy all the time. Sometimes life gets me really, really frustrated. Okay, fair enough. But first of all, I didn't say be happy all the time. I said rejoice all the time. We can rejoice even in the midst of difficulties. Because we know what we're suffering here is only speeding our entrance into heaven later. Second, vent to God in your prayers. Don't be afraid to show your frustration to God in your prayers. Those are some of God's favorite prayers because they're honest. Then we get past the flowery language and get right down to the nitty gritty of it. I can't keep going on like this. Help me. Show me what it is you want me to do. Prayer keeps us focused on the goal. And prayer reminds us to rejoice. In all circumstances, give thanks. Why? Because giving thanks combats negativity. And negativity, as I've said in many previous homilies, is the root of many of our sins. Ultimately, we sin because we're not happy with what we got. We're not happy with our present circumstances, so we swear. We're not happy with ourselves, so we gossip about others. We're not happy with our marriage or our lack of a marriage, so we lust. We want what our neighbor has, his house, his car, his toys, so we become unhappy with our finances. That leads us to steal or be dishonest or live beyond our means, which is a form of pride, or be selfish. So I can't give any money to charity because I need all my money. But the money isn't really to support your needs. Rather, it's to support your wants. Ultimately, every sin comes down to a lack of gratitude about something. Thus, give thanks in all circumstances. Count your blessings. Be grateful. Instead of looking to what others have that you don't, look rather to what you have that others don't. Spend a little time in prayer every day, just going through the list in your head of everything you have to thank God for. And then you will be content with what you've got. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In all circumstances, give thanks. A great little formula for living a happy life and an even happier eternal life. And blessed be God forever. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. 